and we were talking about the dinner that we're going to have right after church. And she said, wouldn't it be something? She just said, if while service was going on, the Lord raptured the church, and we'd be there after di for dinner at the marriage supper at the Lamb. <laughs> Woo! And I am Baptist. I'm Baptist. <laughs> but I can get happy when I think about Jesus coming back. Oh, my goodness, all these ladies is prepared all of this wonderful food and all of you are invited and we'll go downstairs and partake of that food, but I'll tell you it's nothing like we're going to see at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it wouldn't disappoint me if the Lord came right in the middle of my sermon. I don't have anything that important to say. It is important, and I hope that you listen, and I hope that you listen very closely, and I'll tell you why, because Paul said that our preaching is a savor unto unto life or a savor unto death. Now, what he meant by that was this. When you leave here today, you will leave here far better off or you will leave far worse off. You will either leave here saved or you will leave further into condemnation. And that is terrible. This morning, if you will turn to the fourth chapter of Genesis... This morning I will be preaching on the way of Cain. The way of Cain. The Bible teaches us that Adam and Eve uh, were created by God. They were placed in the Garden of Eden. But Adam and Eve sinned and God drove them out of the Garden. And then we come to this point. It says that Adam and Eve had a son named Cain and a son named Abel. And it's ironic because one of the sons, Abel, is listed in the, in the 10th chapter of Hebrews and he is listed in the Faithful's Hall of Fame. He will go down on record throughout eternity as being the first, listed as the first hero of faith. But here we have the other brother, Cain, and he will also go down in history and go down through eternity as being listed as the first man born on planet Earth to become an apostate. That's ironic. Now listen, you cannot blame Cain's horrible sin upon, uh, uh, upon heritage. You, he cannot claim that he had an alcoholic grandfather because he didn't have a grandfather. We can't say that Abel was saved because of a godly grandmother on his mother's side because he didn't have a grandmother. They both were identical in that they had the same parents. Now, you can't say it was because of Cain's environment because Cain and Abel both had the very same environment. Now, uh, Mother Eve can't say, well, you know, Cain just got mixed up in the wrong crowd. Because, you see, there wasn't a crowd. There was just Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve. But the Bible declares that Cain was an apostate. And this morning, we're going to find out what is apostasy. How did Cain commit apostasy? What is that horrible sin of apostasy? Now, apostasy is, apostasy is a sin... And, it's, and, and a person that, that commits apostasy is just outside of the reach of God's grace. A man that commits apostasy, he can never come back. He can never be redeemed. He has crossed God's deadline. And here's what Jude says about apostasy. We know that Satan was the first apostate. He apostatized because of pride. He, his pride, he was lifted up because of pride and became an apostate. And when Satan was kicked out of heaven, or Lucifer at that time, his name was Lucifer, when he was kicked out of heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. And these angels are known as apostate angels. And Jude says... Concerning the angels... And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness into the judgment of the great day. And speaking of apostates, he says this, 
They are raging waves of the sea, foaming out their shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. There is no hope for an apostate. When a person apostatizes, there's no turning back. That's the end of the road. God gives up, and that person is sentenced and doomed to a devil's hell. Well, what is the sin of apostasy? We find in Hebrews, the sin of apostasy is sinning against great light. That's what it is. It, you see, the only people that can be, a, can be an apostate are religious folks. They are people that know the right way, but deliberately turn from that. It says in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now he goes on to say this, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite into the Spirit of grace. So we see that apostasy is a deliberate and a malicious and a willful act when God has given you the truth and you refuse to accept the truth and deliberately turn from that truth. He says when that happens, he said the only thing you've got to look for is fiery indignation and the wrath of God. Why? Because it says that that apostate wades to hell through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not accept the way that God has ordained for man to be saved. Now that's an apostate. And the Bible teaches that Cain was the first apostate. Now we're going to find out what did he do and, and show how that Cain sinned against great light. Now uh, all my life, or ever since I've been a preacher, I've had people ask me this question from time to time. They say, Jerry, what about all those people that lived before the flood? that all died in Noah's flood. What about all those Andalusians? Uh, they didn't have a chance. The gospel wasn't preached to them. They didn't know how to be saved. There was no gospel light. We're going to find out if they had gospel light or not. We're going to find out just how much they did know. Now, let's turn to Genesis. That's the text. Turn to Genesis, the fourth chapter. Now, there's not very many verses here. I'm going to read seven verses. But I think we'll be surprised to find out how much is said in these seven verses. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou thy wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt, not be accept well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. All right, now from these verses, let's see what did Adam or Cain and Abel know. First of all, they knew that God required a sacrifice. See, why do we know that? Because they brought a sacrifice. That isn't something you just dream up. They wouldn't just sit around someday and say, you know what, I think God would be pleased if we could get some vegetables and if we'd get an animal and uh, pile up some wood and just go burn it. You wouldn't come up with something like that. You'd never imagine or dream up something like that. Now, let's say, for instance, Monday, I call Brother Bill, and I say, Brother Bill, now, I really believe that Tuesday, exactly at 2.30, God would be pleased if we would go down to the Arkansas River and wade it. And I believe if we do, we'll be saved. Now, first thing he's going to ask me is, well, where did you come up with this? Did God give you a divine revelation? No, it's just a hunch he'd immediately hang up the phone, make another phone call. And in a few minutes, there'd be some guys out there with a white jacket. So we know from this 
that Cain and Abel knew they had been told that God requires a sacrifice. Now something else the text says they knew. They knew when to bring the sacrifice. When? At the end of days. There was a specific designated time at the end of days. Now what does that mean at the end of days? More than likely, now I'm not dogmatic about this, but more than likely it meant at the end of harvest. After harvest was over, after they brought in their crops and so forth, then that was the designated time to go make the sacrifice to God. Now, whether that was the designated time or not, we know there was a designated time because they brought it at the end of days. In other words, there was a specified time. Another thing they knew is they knew where to bring it. Because what does it say? They brought it unto the Lord. They knew where to bring it. Now, uh, where do you suppose that, would might, that might be? Well, let me give you my idea. Now, let's notice something, and let's read something. Uh, verse 24. After Adam and Eve sinned, God here, here's, here's what happened. God, so he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, keep in mind, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening. Now, it says God drove them out. He drove them out, which signifies they went before God. The wrath of God drove them out. Now, the last place they had any contact with God was where? At the east gate of the Garden of Eden where he placed the cherubim. Now, we go over in Le Leviticus, we find this. God says, when a man brings the sacrifice, he is to bring it at the east end or the east gate of the tabernacle. Not only that, the blood was, was applied to the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat was the Ark of the Covenant, the lid was called the mercy seat. It was applied to the Ark of the Mercy Seat. The Ark of the Covenant was a wooden box overlaid with, overlaid with gold, and on each one was statues of cherubim and Shekinah glory which is representative of God's presence would dwell between the cherubim so now wait a minute you say well I don't know so much about that and I don't, I don't really know whether that's where they went well regardless of where they went they knew where to go because they brought it unto the Lord so here's what we have they knew God required a sacrifice they knew that God required a specific time to bring the sacrifice and they knew where to bring the sacrifice. So see, they did know something about God, and they did know something about redemption. Now, the Bible says this, that Abel was a keeper of sheep, and he brought a sheep. But that Cain was a tiller of the ground, so therefore he brought produce. Now, from that, we would assume that since Abel was a keeper of sheep, that's the reason he brought a sheep. And that since Cain was a tiller of the ground, that's the reason he brought Produce, but that's not correct. The reason a Abel brought a sheep is because God told him to bring a sheep. The reason Cain did not bring a sheep is because he was not obedient and he wanted to worship God his way. You say, well, Jerry, can you back that up? Yes, I can. Over in the book of Hebrews, it says, by faith, Abel brought a more excellent sacrifice unto God. Now, what does that mean, by faith he brought it? Well, faith is first hearing something, believing something, and then acting upon something. So God told him, Abel believed it, and then he brought it. Now, I'll just get, let me show you something. Now, Kathy's downstairs, and he, she's getting the dinner ready. Now, let's say I'm up here preaching my head off. Kathy comes running up the stairs, and she runs over here and whispers something in my ear. And here's what she says. Jerry. The whole kitchen and downstairs is on fire. The whole basement is on fire. All right, now, first of all, I'm going to believe her because for two reasons. Kathy is not a liar, and she's not going to run up here and interrupt this sermon to pull a joke on me. Now, you all are going to get the information as I'm going out the door. I'll guarantee you I'm going to act upon that. That is faith. I heard what she said, I believed what she said, and I acted upon what she said. So we know this, that Abel, by faith, brought a lamb. Cain, by unbelief, brought what he wanted to bring, of vegetables. Now, let's give old Cain the benefit of the doubt, all right? 
Now, let's say God didn't tell those boys directly through direct revelation. He didn't speak to them with an audible voice and say, listen, fellas, I demand a sacrifice, and here's the time to bring it. Here's the place to bring it, and I want you to bring a lamp. Let's say, for instance, God did not tell them in that way. And more than likely, he didn't tell them in that way. More than likely, Adam and Eve told those boys what God required. All right, now let's say this. Cain says this to himself. Now, Mama and Daddy said that we are to go at a specific time and make a sacrifice, and we're to offer a lamb. But now, they didn't say that God wouldn't accept produce. They just said God wanted a lamb. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that he wasn't malicious with it. He just said, well, I know that God, that's what Mama says God said. That's secondhand information. That's what mom and daddy said, God said. But you know what? I, you know, I raise good produce, and I'm going to give God the best produce I've got. And you know, I really believe that God will accept that produce. All right, now the first time, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But look what it says. It says that God had respect unto Abel's sacrifice, but he didn't have respect unto Cain's sacrifice. Now what does that mean? That means some way God let them boys know whose sacrifice he accepted. Now, how do you suppose he did that? Well, I've got a guess. Do you remember uh, when Elijah was contending with the prophets of Baal? Now, he called all of Israel, and he said, Now, listen. Now, Israel, they're worshiping God a little bit, and then they're worshiping Baal a little bit. And he said, How long halt ye between two opinions? He said, If God be God, worship him. If Baal be God, worship him. And he said, Let the true God answer by fire. So he told the Baalites, he said, Now, I want all you priests to build you an altar, put your sacrifice on the altar, and then you pray to your God, and the real God will answer by fire. He will ignite it and consume the offering. So they built their altar, and they put their animals on it, and boy, they began to pray, and they prayed all day, and they cried, and they bawled, and they squalled, and they cut their flesh, and they did everything, and Elijah said, well, pray a little louder. Maybe your God's on vacation. He said, pray a little louder. Maybe he's asleep. And they went all day long, and they finally just tucked it out. Then Elijah said, all right. He said, build the altar, put the wood on it, put the animals on it. And he said, we're not through yet. He said, dig a trench around it. He said, now pour water all over the altar, all over the offering, all over the wood, and fill the trench with water. Now, after he'd done that, he just prayed a little simple prayer. He said, God, let the fire fall. God sent fire from heaven that not only consumed the offering and the wood, but licked up the water. Now, Cain, however God chose to let him know, Cain knew God did not accept vegetables. But look what happened. Now, here's where he goes into apostasy. In a little bit, we're going to tell you what the offerings say. They speak to us too. God, man, that made Cain furious. He was wroth. That meant he was filled with wrath. And God said, Cain, why are you so furious? He said, if you do well, in other words, if you go get a little lamb and offer it, he said, I'll accept you. But, but Cain refused to get a lamb. No way am I going to bring a lamb and offer it to God. And from that time on, God never once again offered him salvation. The next time God spoke to Cain, it was to pronounce judgment on Cain, and Cain left, said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Cain knew the truth. Cain knew what God required, but Cain deliberately said, no, I'm not coming that way. If I can't do it my way, I'll have nothing to do with it. Now, now wait a minute. Now, now let's assume for a minute. Would you have to assume that maybe, you see, the, 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 the one that offered it was required to cut the throat of the lamb. I was telling uh, Johnny and Penny that yesterday, and Penny said, Ooh, she said, I don't know if I could do that or not. Take a little lamb and cut his throat. Well, I can understand a lot of you people are squimish. I am too. I was a meat cutter for 40 years, but I never did like slaughterhouses. But now listen, you suppose that's the reason Cain didn't want to bring the lamb? No. Because it says that he rose up in the field and slew his brother Abel. The word slew in Hebrew means to butcher by cutting the jugular vein. He wouldn't kill a lamb, but he would cut his brother's throat. 
Why wouldn't he bring the lamb? The same reason people today won't bring the lamb. Because I'll tell you why. When you bring a lamb, here's what it signifies. When they brought the lamb, they must lay their hands upon the head of the lamb, and that's called designation. I designate this innocent lamb to die in my stead, and then my sins is transferred to the lamb. Now, Cain's not going to bring a lamb because to bring a lamb is admitting I'm a lost, hell-deserving sinner, and my sins have offended a holy God, but I bring this innocent lamb to die in my stead. Cain, I'm not going that way. Well, I'm not all that bad. Why, why I bought the best produce. Well, we got people doing the same thing today. Why, well, wait a minute. No, now I'm a good person. Why, I'm a deacon in the Baptist church. Why, I joined the church. I got baptized. I teach Sunday school class. Why, I'm a deacon. Don't ask me to come as a hell-deserving sinner on my knees and ask God for mercy. Cain was filled with pride because the Bible says that he was the seed of the serpent. Satan was filled with pride. Cain said, I am not coming. Now, I will come with my righteousness. I will come and offer to God my good works, what my hands produce, but I'm not coming and going to cut a lamb's throat and admit to God or anybody else that I'm a sinner. That's the way of Cain. That's the way of Cain. Vegetables speak of the works of his own hands. There's a song that says, Lord, take a look at my hard-working hands. When I die and go to the judgment, I'll just say, Lord, take a look at my hard-working hands. Listen, the only hands God's interested are in are the nail-pierced hands. Cain said, Lord, just take a look at my hard-working hands. Friend, you will never get gain entrance to heaven by your works. Now, let me show you something else. Cain was very religious. That's the reason he was apostate. You see, here's what, here's what uh, John said. Speaking of apostates, he said, uh, they went out from us to signify that they came out, apostates come out of the church. They're religious folks. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Whoa. They were religious, but lost. They were hypocrites. They were pretenders. They slip in, and Jude says, they creep in sideways. They creep in unaware. They come in, they join the church, but they've never been born again. They've never brought the sin offering. The blood has not been shed. See, they're religious, but they're lost. But now notice something. Cain was very religious. He brought the sacrifice, didn't he? He brought it at the right time, didn't he? He brought it to the right place, didn't he? He offered it upon an altar, didn't he? Yes, but notice, he brought the wrong sacrifice. That's the only difference. He brought the right, wrong sacrifice. Now, now, see, that's a perfect picture of godless religion. Now, let me show you how you can know if all you got is religion. Now, here's how you know if you got religion or whether you got salvation. There is no power in religion to re restrain sin. Listen, you can be the biggest drunkard in town and be religious. Did you know that? You can be a murderer and be religious. Cain was. You can be a thief. You can be anything you want to do and have religion because the power is not in the ordinance. It's in the blood. I'll tell you what I love to see new converts. It's amazing what happens. I can always tell when a convert has truly, by faith, laid hold upon the blood sacrifice because, friend, you're going to see a change in their life. I mean, all of a sudden, they love God. They can't get enough of it. Man, they can't get enough of Bible study. They can't get enough of church. They can't get enough of singing. Man, I mean, their life is a complete flip-flop. Why? The power is in the blood, and they've laid hold by faith and laid their hands upon the, on the sacrifice that God accepted. Boy, I love to see new converts. Woo, boy, they just do a flip-flop. I mean, it's amazing. Listen, that's not reformation. That's regeneration. Look at Cain. He didn't have the power. He was filled with wrath. It got out of control, and he cut his own brother's throat. He was just religious as a goose, but just as lost as a duck. No power in his life. And I'll tell you, the world is filled with religious people that don't have any power in their life to live for God because all they got is religion. Religion. Woe unto them, for they go in the way of Cain. They go in the way of apostasy. Now, what is it? John the Baptist, when he was baptizing, 
he looked up and saw Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Isaiah said it, proved, it, it pleased the Lord to grieve him and to make his soul an offering for sin. Isn't that great? You know what that means? That means Jesus was the Lamb of God that went to an old rugged cross and his blood was shed instead of mine. In place of the sinner. His lifeblood was poured out there. Now, how do we know that God accepted his sacrifice? He raised him from the dead. Amen. Friend, that's the reason we come to church on Easter is say God accepted the sacrifice. I know I'm saved because God accepted the sacrifice. He raised him from the dead. Listen, if, listen, if God had not accepted Jesus as the sacrifice, if your sins by the blood of Jesus was not completely paid for, He'd still be in the tomb. But God said, I accept his death as payment for your sins in full. Now, I'll tell you something. Salvation's in the blood. Now, don't forget that. Now, hang on to that. You say, now, but Jerry, uh, oh, where does church membership come in? Where does baptism come in? Where does good works come in? Now, there's a place for that. Now, we're going to take that, and we're going to set it over here to side in a neat little pile. Now you take your church membership and your baptism and all your, your deaconship and your preaching and all your Sunday school class teaching and all your witnessing and all those things you do. That's good. And there's a place for it. We're going to lay it to one side. And I'm going to show you where it goes. It says in Leviticus, there's two things that the Jews couldn't eat. One of them was blood because life is in the blood. The blood's poured out as atonement for sin. God said, don't eat the blood. But there's one other thing that they couldn't eat and that's the fat. Why? Because the fat was considered the choice part of the animal. And that belonged to God. He said, take the fat, take the kidney fat, the, the flank fat, the call fat, and offer it separately. That's another sacrifice altogether. Now, he said, when you burn the fat, burn it up completely. And he said, the smoke will rise up to heaven. And God said, that's a sweet odor to me. Now, what does the fat represent? The fat represents my dedication to him. My service to him. But keep in mind, first the throat was cut, the blood was shed, and I'm saved. Then I take the fat and offer it upon the altar. What did Paul say? He said, present your body as a living sacrifice. See? You know what a lot of people have applied the blood? You know, they've accepted the death of Jesus for their sin, and they're saved. But they've never put the fat on the altar. They've never been baptized. They've never joined the church. They won't come to church. They won't come to Sunday school. See, they, they, see, the fat was the choicest part. God deserves your best. Lay your life on the altar and offer it up to God. Now, I want to tell you something. There's no salvation. There's no redemption in the fat. Okay? It's all in the blood. Now, notice something. First, you've got to cut the throat before you can get the fat. First, you've got to be saved before you can. See, God won't accept the fat until first the blood shed. Now, you can't come in and say, I'm just a good guy and I'm going to do the best I can and I'm going to work for God. That doesn't work. Cain said, I'm coming my way or I'm not coming. The shedding of blood. Some time ago, I wrote a song. And I want you to listen to the words of this song because the words of this song is part of this sermon this morning. And then after we sing the song, I will close the song, the this, this sermon. With one more point. Okay, yes. Sir. The triune God. The triune God. Back in eternity. Eternity. Look down through time. Look down. And saw the sinner and saw his name. compelled by love, compelled by love. Our God, God ordained, God a, plan ordained a plan to buy us back, to buy us back. Behold a lamb, behold a lamb, Eden lost. Eden because of one man cause of Adam brought total ruin brought total ruin on all of Adam's on king. All his king the 
Spirit speaks. The Spirit speaks to helpless fallen man. Just look and live. Just look and live. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Behold God's Lamb. Behold God's Lamb. The perfect sacrifice. The no spot or flaw. No, no I know that he'll, yes, suffice he'll suffice upon that cross. Upon that cross, the Savior's, the Savior's blood was shed. He died that day. He died that day in every sinner's day. Just look to Christ. Just look to Christ. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. When Israel sinned, when Israel sinned, they brought a sacrifice. They brought a sacrifice. The vic- the victim died, the victim died, by way of Aaron's by night, Aaron's night. Upon, his head. upon his head, the sinner, the laid, sinner his laid his hand, he takes my place, he takes my place, behold the Lamb. God's righteous law. God's righteous law demands the sinner demands die. the sinner die. I stand condemned. I stand condemned. And no defense have I. No defense. But Jesus died. Yes, Jesus died. And now I understand. I understand. He took my place. He took my place. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Behold God's Lamb. Behold God's Lamb. The perfect sacrifice. No spot or flaw. No, no flaw. I know that He'll suffice. Yes, He'll suffice. Before God's throne, before God's throne, oh sinner, sinner, when you stand, if He should ask, if He should ask, why should I let you? Why should I let you? Well, then just turn, then just turn, and slow. Just point to Jesus. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Oh, but yeah. Jesus is the perfect Lamb. Do you know where most people get saved? It might surprise you. It's not up here.